Thank you very much. Um, I'm very struck by the length of time. Just can you just repeat how long the four of you were working together? Uh, we were two weeks. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a lot of trust there, isn't there, in terms of the way? Yes. Can you I say anything about that? Yeah. Um, it was two weeks in the field. Now, it was probably about two weeks setting up so there was previously in London. So um, we'd kind of talk about what we wanted to achieve, the kind of um, shots we wanted to do. We talked to Andy and Campbell extensively so that they could then make recommendations on the equipment that we should take. We then built all the, well, they built all the rigs here. And we, I, can't, I don't think we actually shot, we certainly didn't take them out of, um, you know, out of initiative, but we just made sure they were all going to be up and running and that we'd have the range of equipment and spares that we needed in case you know, to, to cover all eventualities. Um, what I think is, to me, the absolute key, it's almost, it has to sort of go without saying, is the relationship between the DOP and the stereographer. Because with Andy and Mark, or Campbell and Mark, it was unspoken. It, you just knew that, for a start, Mark had spent a long time thinking about how he wanted to frame shots in order for them to be in 3D rather than 2D. So he was, I hope, never producing shots where, oh, I don't think he was, where Andy would think, ha, that's just not going to work. So that, that's on the, the DOP's responsibility. But then Andy or Campbell as the stereographers were working so fast and intuitively, not to override what Mark was doing, but to make it fit in with the type of shot we were trying to achieve without saying anything. There was literally, because you can't with wildlife, you can't have a great conversation about it because it, it's all too fast and it, it'll all be gone. Um, and also you will put things off. So it was happening incredibly intuitively. And I think it was just because, if I, I think it's because Andy and Campbell and Nishan know so well 3D and so well what to do in their area. And we've got the expertise, you know, 20 years of expertise in Africa. And you, when you bring two groups together like that, you, it, it can just flow. So there's a, there's a great deal which is happening through intuition uh, placed on that experience that you all bring to the party. Yes, and mm. nobody trying to override the other. It was just very definitely everybody trying to achieve uh, sort of, I don't the best doesn't sound, it's a bit vague, but just... We kind of all knew what we were trying to achieve, and it was just working as easily as possible to make that happen. You have a lot of experience, of course, mm. in making this kind of content. Uh, had you not had that experience in terms of storytelling, mm. uh, would life be more difficult? Yeah, I don't think, I mean, you, I'm sure you could go in for two weeks, and it's the thing, it depends when, but if you went in at, in the end of 2009 for two weeks, I don't think very many people would have pulled off that much because the technology was at that stage. Now, I wouldn't like to say, but it definitely relied on the mixture of the expertise and just the, you know, we, yeah, we, we know it like anybody else would know their, <laughs> their area. Okay, at this point, um, again, I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. Anyone in particular like to start off? With? There's a couple of questions. Um, if you'd like to take the mic. To can we have some lights so we can see? Apparently we can't. Oh, okay. <laughs> it would mm -hmm. help us if you would stand up. I'm sorry, as you understand, we're, we're facing we're in quite a lit area, but we're looking into a, quite a low lit area. If you'd like to say a little about who you are and what you do. Um, hi, I'm Moira. Um, I thought the film was brilliant. And I was wondering, will it show in the IMAX or has it already shown? Um, no, this is just a, a pilot. I've, I think... The IMAX, whether it gets converted to IMAX, will depend on the distributors. Um, at the moment, it's not designed as that. Um, it's very different. I've, I've looked at that on an IMAX um, screen, and you'd have to edit it slightly differently because, for example, the close-ups are just too much. In IMAX, on this, your close-ups would be your mid-shots. If you have the close-ups like of elephants' heads and stuff, it just makes no sense. It's just too much because of the way in which you sit in relation to the screen and the fact it's sort of got no edges compared to this. So you've made that for TV, really? No, this will be for digital cinema. So it'll be like in the, your local uh, multiplex. Okay, well, well done. That's, <laughs> I think it's brilliant. Obviously not this, but the, the final, that's just the pilot for the final and film. And is it a full-length feature film you're, yes, you're planning on making about the journey of the elephants? Yeah, it's really about the, it, it's about lack of water and it's about what happens to 
um, when the elephants are pushed to move from their normal area, what happens both to them and what happens to the smaller animals they leave behind and, and how they will, I won't go into the whole thing now, but how they'll actually make it back and, because basically they live in balance together and they need that balance back for everyone to survive. Well, congratulations. Thanks. Uh, question over there. Hello there. Two, two, two. Hi, my name's Richard Hughes. Um, just, I'm a freelance filmmaker as well as working at Ravensbourne, particularly in wildlife filmmaking. So I'm quite intrigued. I go out and film a lot of uh, sequences. Uh, as, you, as you are aware, you don't know when things are going to happen. They're often instantaneous. When you're moving around with your rig, your camera rig, on the back of a truck, how long is it, does it take you to re-rig, re reposition the cameras before you get the shot? Because it's often with wildlife, you can miss it yeah. if it's not instant. Was that, a, was that a bit of trial and error? Or did you really have to take care of the rig when you're moving it around? And how quickly was it to set up? We basically had a, a specially adapted car, which had like a side mount to it, which, and we had the ability for, it took two people to lift the mirror rig, which is what we used most of the time. And we had several different rigs. We had side-by-side -side mirror. We had a small um, mirror rig on a gyro. Um, but from a vehicle, most of the time, it was a uh, mirror rig. And to, it would take Mark, the DOP, and Campbell or Andy just to swing it up into position. And then, depending on how joggled about it had been between the last shot and the next, or between you know, what the sequences, affected how long it took to set it up. But it certainly took longer than 2D. But, and sure, I'm sure there will be incidences, instances where we do miss certain things, but it's not so prohibitively slow that you'd say, this isn't even worth trying. Um, it, I, th I think more important with wildlife is choosing your subjects, because it, for example, if someone said to us, would you like to do a 3D cat film, um, and, they, and they were really interested in the chase, I'd say, well, that actually is not the best use of 3D and probably not, not particularly interesting. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure you can make it somewhat interesting. But, so I think the, the choice of subject is probably fairly crucial. Thank you. Another question, please. No hands up at the moment. Oh, yes, yes, gentleman there. Were you using fixed focal length lenses? Uh, we, no, we had, um, on the mirror rig, we had uh, Canon zoom lenses. Andy could tell you in absolute detail. And then we used a whole array of lenses. Some of them were just literally lenses from um, CCTV cameras. So it was, I wouldn't hold it up as being, here is the best quality you know, image in some of those shots just because we were working with what was available and it, we were much more interested in whether the 3D would work than, than the quality. Well, obviously, we wanted it as high as possible. Um, so we worked with both fixed focal length lenses and zoom lenses. No, I mean, it's, it's interesting because the quality really held up. There was absolute, it felt like there was an absolute consistency across, it did across the shots. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's <clears throat> what I was interested in asking because yeah, no, we, and we used a huge variety of things. And, you know, you can imagine keeping mirrors clean in an environment like that. I mean, we were going through dust sometimes. We kept a big plastic bag over it when we were traveling. But it would literally be billowing around us. And I would think, oh, well, this is just never going to work. And it was amazing how fast we could clear it and clean it enough to get the shot. Now, it did mean, oops, sorry. It did mean in post that we had to remove, we did have artifacts on one eye and not the other. And we did have quite a bit of that kind of fixing to do. Um, but I think you're always going to have that with, well, with anything that you have to react to in an unpredictable environment. I mean, you know, in a studio setup, you could clean and perfect. You could control your lighting. You can control everything about it. In the wild, you can't. And we were like in the water scenes, the elephants were splashing that water everywhere. Um, and it was definitely on the mirror. And, you know, we had to work to get rid of that. Um, but what I think for us was pleasing was that you could get rid of it and you could make it, um, you know, so that it was watchable. Because when, when the, when the water's on those lenses, it's not watchable. I mean, on the mirror. Yeah. 